Thank you. So I'm going to talk um, about the medical implications of less lethal weapons. Thanks very much to the um, IASR, IASR for uh, inviting me um, to talk about this. And I'm delighted to be here at the 8th International E-Conference on Forensic Medicine and Toxicology. Um, I'm uh, dialing in from uh, Essex in the east of England. We're hoping that my signal, because I'm reliant on a mobile hotspot to speak, will last long enough. I'm going to try and condense into 30 minutes a few thoughts about um, less lethal weapons. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, because we have a, a mixed audience, I'm just going to go through my own personal um, thoughts about what's relevant and, and what we should what we should be doing. So. Uh, I suppose the first thing we need to consider is when might law enforcement or other state sanctioned bodies, and I'm looking across the world, so for example, police, military and security forces, when might they use force, force generally of any kind? And it may first of all be with just single individuals um, in, who are acutely behaviorally disturbed. So they may be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, they may have got mental health issues, but those are not the key um, facts we're probably going to talk about today, although they are significant because less lethal weapons, which I'll um, show you how I, I, I define shortly, um, may be applied in, in both individual settings. And then more significantly, I think at the moment, in terms of large crowds, public pro protest and public assemblies and the kind of things where I think less lethal weapons may be applied are all these kind of protests. And I've given examples of ones which may apply frankly to any country in the world, but things like anti-government protest, mixture between pro-government and anti-government uh, uh, politicians or, or individuals, uh, meet the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. More recently, um, people protesting about anti-masking or COVID-19 lockdowns, and then overarching all of that, perhaps climate change. So I think whatever country you're in, all of these kind of things, and you'll have your own local ones, may apply. So um, if we look at the USA, there was the storming of the capital. If we look at the Philippines, there were um, uh, associated issues. These are all within the last uh, year or so. If we look at the United Kingdom, we've had multiple riots and public order issues related to the whole variety of um, matters that, I, that, that I've just listed. Um, in Australia, in the last few days, it's been reported that, uh, to use the colloquial term, rubber bullets and tear gas have been used um, in uh, the, the dealing with uh, anti-lockdown riots in Melbourne, in Australia. So I don't think there's any part of the world that's not affected in some way by discontent. And, and frankly, in most cases, I think it's reasonable discontent about how governments are treating their people, are treating groups of people. Um, so uh, whatever the reasons for these increased use of state-sanctioned less lethal weapons, I think it's likely to uh, enlarge and develop. And um, a, a recent uh, report, the Police Lethal Force and Accountability Monitoring Deaths in Western Europe, I think stated um, quite nicely that um, in democratic societies, good policing depends on um, public consent and the acceptance of the role of the police. And it makes the point that um, events around the globe ha ha have made the tensions, I think, between police, security and military and the public, whom they, I, th I generally think, should serve, um, tensions have increased. And, and in particular, in the last year or so, the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, I think, um, stimulated quite a lot of uh, further concerns and protests all around the world. The report's very interesting to use because it, to, to, to read because it talks about, although it's talking about lethal force, it talks about what should and should not be monitored in any country, in any jurisdiction. So if we think of what kind of restraint and control method, methods that may be used, we've got um, the kind of things which I put in white here, the conflict resolution, empty hand techniques, handcuffs, 
battens, dogs and horses, which um, I don't think would be considered generally less lethal uh, weapons, but those are all part of the, um, I call it the therapeutic armamentarium that uh, security police and law enforcement professionals generally have to them in many, many countries uh, and certainly uh, here in the, in the UK. But the things that we're probably just going to touch on, and it really will only be touching on um, uh, today, are those what that I think most of us would consider um, fall into the category of less lethal weapons. And these include chemical irritant sprays, incapacitants. Now, incapacitants and irritant sprays, the terms used to be interchangeable. Incapacitants now are used to uh, describe generally chemical um, weapons that can cause uh, unconsciousness and, uh, and coma rather than the irritant sprays which may cause uh, eye, chest uh, and, and or respiratory and, and skin problems. We'll talk a little bit about kinetic impact projectiles um, and other types of rounds similar to those and conducted energy weapons which for the purposes of most of us generally refer to some form of taser device. Although we won't go into it, dazzle devices and acoustic devices are undoubtedly um, going to be developed or are being developed and are uh, available to some extent and may be used, I think, by state authorities in the future. And then water cannon used by um, a, a wide variety of jurisdictions, but not in mainland United Kingdom. So what is a less lethal weapon? Uh, well. The terms began to be used around about early 1990s um, when the United Nations basic principles on the use of force and firearms by law enforcement officials document um, set out a number of principles and principle two was that it asked governments and law enforcement agencies to develop a range of means as broad as possible which should include the development of non-lethal Incapacitating, incapacitating weapons for use in appropriate situations. So the term, you'll still see the term non-lethal used, um, but I think that pretty much we, we can say that anything that is non-lethal, and by that it generally means not firearms, not guns that are firing bullets or other um, charges, but non-lethal, the, the term that is most appropriately used and is used by all relevant authorities now is less lethal. The fact being that most of these um, devices or systems uh, can cause fatality in some cases. And then the second principle that the 1990 UN document uh, came up with is principle three, which says they should all be carefully evaluated in order to minimize the risk of endangering uninvolved persons. And I'd add to that the person, the people deploying them as well as opposed not just to innocent bystanders and that they used to be carefully controlled. So I don't think anybody would find those too challenging or, or um, you know, criticize that approach. Um, there's no doubt that the police, the military and security require some forms of restraint. But then we come to a document that I'd recommend everybody to read, which you can see on the screen here, which is the UN Human Rights Guidance on Less Lethal Weapons and Related Equipment in Law Enforcement. And that was published um, in 2020. So this is really up, up the minute good review of what le less lethal weapons are and what we should expect from people using them. So what is a less lethal weapon? It's a weapon designed or intended for use on individuals or groups of individuals and which in the course of expected or reasonably foreseen use have a lower risk of causing death or serious injury than firearms. So you'll note that there is no question here, less lethal weapons are still considered to be potentially lethal. Um, for the purposes of this guidance, the UN guidance, the term includes conventional firearms when they're used to discharge less lethal ammunition. The use of physical means, and I think this is also important when you're documenting um, what's going to be used, the use of physical means to coerce or influence behavior or damage property. Such means may be kinetic, chemical, electrical, or of another kind. And that could suggest include, um, for example, technologies that have not yet been, been thought of or are not yet in place. Um, they emphasize again, use of force may injure and kill. 
But another point to um, recognize is that when you're documenting the use of these less lethal weapons, the LLWs, you must remember that a weapon may be used to apply force in a general sense without being discharged. So for example, a taser can be pointed at somebody and the red dot sight is put on somebody's chest, but the taser may not be fired. Similarly, personal irritant sprays may be drawn and pointed at somebody with the threat um, of unless they behave themselves or unless the group behave themselves and they will be used. So the, there, is a, there is a subtlety about how data are recorded. What the UN principles say is that states and law enforcement agency will monitor the use and effects of all the less lethal weapons and related equipment, and that there should be publicly available national statistics on deaths and serious injuries relating to different categories of less lethal weapons. Again, I don't think this can be really challenging from anybody's point of view as feeling, well, this is, the, 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 this is an acceptable approach to use. Um, it then goes on to say that law enforcement officials should receive appropriate and in initial and refresher training in the use and effect of these less lethal weapons. Now, um, I don't think there's any country in the world that is now and, uh, not uh, challenged by financial constraints. Um, and uh, although initial training in the use of some of these devices may be there, refresher training, uh, being able to give staff time off to be refresher trained, I just don't think it exists uh, in many countries. And it certainly doesn't um, exist routinely uh, in the United Kingdom or any other jurisdiction in which I've worked. So um, I think this is one particular area where we need to uh, be concerned about um, the appropriate training, but that training should include information on the particular vulnerabilities of certain individuals to the effects of a particular weapon. Perhaps we're talking about irritant sprays to somebody who's, who's got known chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or is undergoing an acute asthmatic attack. So vulnerabilities of certain individuals to the effects of a particular weapon and how to identify especially vulnerable individuals. Well, I don't think that means turning law enforcement officers into doctors, nurses, or, or other healthcare professionals, but I think there's certainly um, a minimum basic level of information that all can be provided with, which can assist them in trying to avoid using such um, weapons or devices or systems on those where the risks are greater. It also says trainees should be made aware not only of the primary risk of injury, but also of the secondary injuries that may result. Um, and we'll give a couple of examples in a bit. And then finally, and I think just as important, is that it is advised that when a less lethal weapon has been used, medical assistance will be rendered to any injured or affected person at the earliest possible moment, irrespective of whether the injured person is a suspected offender. Uh, that's not really surprising, I think, to us as medical or nursing um, or other professionals, because we shouldn't be determining whether or not we give care or treatment to somebody based on any um, particular characteristic. Of them. We should treat everybody as a patient. So then how does, does the UN document classify less lethal weapons? Well, I think this is quite interesting, and um, they refer to injury as physical or physiological bodily trauma resulting from the interaction of the body with energy, so mechanical, thermal, electrical, or radiant, or due to extreme pressure in an amount or at a rate of transfer that exceeds physical or physiological tolerance, or with toxic chemical substances. Now, my only concern about injury here is that I think it's an over-complex definition because I think you can use injury in the ordinary sense of the word that most of us um, use it, but I think also that it excludes what I think is probably a, uh, a, a relevant uh, uh, part of, of injury, and that may include psychological injury. Um, it also doesn't really define um, or, or determine whether or not it's referring to short, middle, medium or, or, or long term injury. Um, so that's 
a point of, I think, perhaps to remember, it defines moderate injury as an injury that's not life-threatening, but is more severe than a minor injury, such as a small cut, abrasion, or bruise. So um, I guess that you will all think, as I did, slightly ambiguous here, um, is a moderate injury more severe than a minor injury, such as a small cut, abrasion, or bruise? Are they saying that a minor injury is a small cut, abrasion, or bruise, which I believe is what a minor injury is? and that a moderate injury is one which actually requires treatment, perhaps suture, perhaps um, repair of, of, of um, a broken bone or something. So the definition is a little bit unclear, but perhaps the most important thing that a serious injury is any injury that is potentially life-threatening or life-challenging. So um, for example, loss of sight, and they then define permanent blindness, the irreversible, un uncorrectable loss of vision in at least one eye. So. I think that gives you a sense of how um, the United Nations is looking at less lethal weapons and the injury. So I don't think it's perfect, um, but, but I think it's a good start. Um, so let's just run through some examples of less lethal weapons and injuries. And, and so please forgive me because we're running through a lot in, in, a, in a, a, a brief time. But we can look at water cannon injuries. So water cannon injuries, powerful jet being directed at um, individuals or groups. And here we can see a particular um, example of where a secondary injury may occur. Here's the water jet. And this woman at this point is being knocked backwards. And you can see how easy it would be for an unrestrained fall for her head to strike the ground and, sus and, and she could sus uh, sustain a traumatic brain injury. And so traumatic brain injury after the use of less lethal weapons, and in particular water cannon, is, is well recognised. And this image was taken um, from Istanbul fairly recently. Um, uh, relatively uh, well-known cases where a pensioner, Dietrich Wagner, was blinded um, uh, in Germany by direct impact of a water cannon to his eyes, and he lost the sight in both eyes. So again, that is a, a direct or primary injury as opposed to the traumatic brain injury caused by the impact of the water can and then um, the fall to the ground. Kinetic energy projectiles, these are the ones I think that perhaps uh, often concern me most because most countries will have specific types of uh, kinetic energy pro uh, projectiles that are, that are lawful and that the state sanctions. Um, and uh, as indeed we do have, have in the United Kingdom, I think the danger is there are so many available types of kinetic energy projectiles uh, on the open market um, that you can never be sure what is being used. This is um, a couple of examples. These are the, um, the rounds, and you can see this is a 12 gauge, probably 12 gauge uh, cartridge. And this is from Myanmar uh, riots earlier this year. And, uh, this 12 gauge cartridge will hold three of these uh, projectiles. And you can see here, a man who at relatively close range has been, the, the uh, projectiles have been, or two projectiles have been fired, one, two, three, representing each of these impacts and one, two, three there. So two firings at close range towards the head and neck region and uh, most approved and sanctioned uh, means of using this does not involve uh, direct firing to the head. Um, there are also other types, which again are improved flash balls, sometimes uh, used in um, the uh, in France and, and in Europe, not not certainly in the UK, but in in many jurisdictions around the world. And here you have an example: Kansari and others uh, case report where there's the um, projectile has gone straight into this person's right uh, eye socket and the globe has been completely disrupted. You can see it on the various images here. Globe was um, completely destroyed uh, and loss of vision there. Um, so if we go um, perhaps now onto chemical ir ir irritants and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about those because perhaps that there's more detailed uh, knowledge about those, but still relatively lacking. So chemical irritants or tear gases, these are very broad terms that apply to a lot of things that they've developed almost 100 years ago. But despite that, in terms of their 
use and their mechanisms of injury and potential lethality and long-term morbidity. Very little uh, solid medical evidence database exists. They've generally been considered non-lethal or less lethal um, uh, because it's considered that they just cause temporary eye symptoms, temporary respiratory sim symptoms and temporary skin symptoms. But any of us, I think, who've been um, medically involved in treating or examining or seeing people have been exposed to any form of tear gas. And I won't go into the details of the individual ones at the moment, um, but they can be delivered in, in two ways, either as um, personal irritant spray canisters or, or in um, the form of munitions and projectiles. Uh, but I think that we can safely say that uh, there are concerns most of us will have seen ones where we think um, these, this has created quite a big clinical problem. And we know that in 2013, um, tear gas was estimated, estimated being deployed more than 312 times in protests around the world. I think now um, it would not surprise me if that, that has increased by an order of magnitude, because we can look at um, examples, say, in Chile, we can look in Hong Kong, uh, we can look in Iraq, this is a, uh, a scan of somebody where the actual projectile has penetrated the skull. We can look worldwide and, and find that the, there is an unprecedented number of CS projectiles, CS spray projectiles being used in almost all regions. And for example, and we credit um, for this the Omega Research Foundation, which is UK based charity but which reviews all use of force techniques by um th th that are being bought by governments all around the world it's a very very useful resource but um in in 2019 2020 the chilean government put out an urgent order for 100,000 cs cartridges um 50,000 rubber pellet cartridges 7,000 liters of cs liquid it's a fantastic amount of Stuff. And, and, and I think this is reproduced in many countries around the world and the ways in which such tear gas, CS spray, OC, whatever it is, it's being delivered. It can be sometimes delivered in military style rounds from grenade launchers. Parva or nonivamide is another form of uh, manufactured form of chemical um, where again, it's being used widely, but is there much evidence to show what the direct effects are? Well, the answer is quite simply, no, there's not. But what we do know is that multiple sprays, repeated dosing on individuals um, or multiple CS cartridges in a, in a confined space do increase the risk of morbidity and probably mortality. And Haar and colleagues, so Rahimi Haar and Vince Iacopino and colleagues produced a very nice review in 2017, which looked at chemical irritant deaths, however they were delivered um, over a 25 year period. And they reviewed what the um, outcomes were. And they tried to look at the studies that have been published to determine what they were. So there were a number of high quality studies and I'm pleased to say that one of mine was included in that but the numbers were still relatively low over 25 years. Um, but what they found in 31 studies from 11 countries, over 5,000 people who suffered injuries, two died in relation to chemical irritant sprays, 58 uh, suffered permanent disabilities. 8.7% of the injuries were severe, 17% were moderate, but there were injuries to all body systems. So not only from the direct, the primary effects of the chemical irritant spray, but also indirectly from the projectile munition trauma where the spray was delivered by projectiles. And that included major head injury and vision loss. So they concluded that although chemical weapons may have a limited role in crowd control, they, their findings demonstrated they have a significant potential for misuse. And I think that's the thing is, What's the training of the people who are using them? And do they know what are the risk factors for, for creating harm? And, and they recognized, the study recognized that it led to unnecessary morbidity and uh, mortality. And they finally concluded that a nuanced understanding of the health impacts of chemical weapons and mitigating factors is imperative 
to avoid indiscriminate use of chemical weapons and associated health consequences. Now, whether states, whether law enforcement agencies um, read the medical journals, I think that is another um, matter of contention. The answer being, of course, they don't. Um, and their concern more is to protect um, their officers, to maintain control, um, and that their agenda, I don't think, is so much on what are the risks to innocent people being um, implicated in the use of these less lethal weapons. Um, Satputa and, and colleagues did a study which did show that um, if they looked at assorted riot control agents, um, such as CS, CN, PAR, or CR, that all these agents caused severe impairment of respiratory wearables. Um, this was a, an animal study, but I think uh, transferable to humans and, and of course not taking into the context of potential risks in, in um, people um, who may, for example, may be affected by COVID or long COVID. If we look at tasers, this is a typical one of the taser devices, the X2, currently the T7 is the, is the newest um, model. Um, what can the taser do? Well, it works by um, elect electrical discharge causing neuromuscular incapacitation and pain, but incapacitating individuals. But it's the way in which it does that is by two probes that are generally fired and um, impinge on, on the person uh, being controlled. Those probes, however, are metal, they have a barb on the end, and if they miss the general body target, they can go, for example, here again, directly into the eye globe, causing loss of vision. Um, other effects of taser, maybe, and there are there are many, um, and, I, and I draw you to vast numbers of um, studies and case reports um, in, in citing bodies such as PubMed, but um, the neuromuscular contraction can be very, very severe, and uh, you can end up with thoracic um, compression injury. So, point about I think all of this is. Um, that if you're a doctor or a nurse or somebody assessing somebody who's been subject or prone to um, or, or discharge or, or received discharge or had a less lethal weapon used on them, you need to be aware of what the potential uh, morbidities and, and risk factors for mortality are and to be able to do a competent and thorough assessment to avoid missing any of these complications. And here is another taser example. There's the probe, there's the wire that goes to the taser that conducts the electrical current. There's another probe in this person, but this particular probe has hit the skull. And here you can see on this scan that that probe has actually penetrated the skull table. And so the risks of infection or uh, hemorrhage are, are, are there. So these are not, um, systems that don't have risk. In the UK, we looked at um, a few years ago, trends in the less lethal use of force techniques by police services within England and Wales. And just to give a little background, there's 40 separate police forces in uh, England and Wales, and they all act individually. Um, but they all use uh, irritant sprays, they all use taser. Uh, what we found in our study, um, and, and first of all, just to put into context, in the last year or so, there were almost 500,000 recorded incidents in the UK of use of force of all kinds. Um, if we look at our study in 2000 to 2011, the deployment of irritant spray went over that period from about 3,500 to about 7,000 over a four year period. We look now over 18,000 deployments, of which 9,000 will actually be discharges directly to the individual. We look at TASER, 2007, there were 499 deployments. The TASER was only discharged 15 times. 2011, um, it had gone to 7,200 deployments with 461 instances of discharge. We look now, 27,000 uh, uh, deployments of TASER with at least 3,300 discharges and 
possibly up to another 1,300. The figures are, un are unclear. Firearms, in contrast, because we're not an armed police force, are very, very rarely used. What we found in our earlier study, and things have not changed to this point, no police service of the 40 or so could provide any details of any medical complications related to the use of taser and, and, and irritant spray. Uh, CS personal irritant sprays are what all police officers are, or parva spray, or what all police officers are issued with, and these are approved by our home office. Um, the expected effects on somebody to whom it is discharged include eye effects, which can include iritis, but mainly it's initially pain and discomfort, all of which is supposed to last for round about less than 30 minutes, no longer than that. Um, and you just see reddening to the eyes, people unable to open their eyes. Respiratory um, symptoms, so things like nose discomfort, pain and rhinorrhea, sneezing and coughing. In some cases, bronchospasm, in some cases, pulmonary edema. So quite so potentially quite severe respiratory issues, but again, most of them are supposed to be resolving within 30 minutes or so. This is somebody who's been gagging and coughing and you can see swelling of the uvula here and some little particular hem, which is caused by the choking and coughing. And also skin. So eyes, respiratory and skin are the key elements that are pretty much common to all irritant sprays. Burning sensation, erythema, and this may endure for several, up to 24 hours, uh, but may produce longer term problems such as allergic contact dermatitis, which may not be on the person to whom it is directed, but if a police officer is regularly exposed to the irritant spray, it may require them to change their, their job or their work practice. And again, here you can see the direct effects, rare but still possible, of um, irritant spray and this, these kind of bullis or almost pemphigoid um, appearance of, of the neck here. So irritant sprays in the longer term can also produce contact and seborrheic dermatitis, rosacea, leukoderma, long-term eye conditions which require permanent treatment and respiratory compromise. There is evidence that there may be psychological damage, but none of this is properly evidenced. Um, <coughs> we did a, a study looking um, in around about 2014, a prospective study looking at the effects of what was then termed incapacitant spray, which we now call irritant spray. The key things that we found was that there were a huge number of symptoms that people complained of, but these lasted much longer, so three hours or so at least for, the, for most patients, which was uh, about five or six times longer than the conventional literature um, stated. And we'd find that uh, conjunctival erythema, skin erythema, rhinorrhea were the most common symptoms. But what we concluded was that symptoms and in, in this prospective study, as opposed to a retrospective data draw, was that there were symptoms and signs of exposure to irritants spray lasted much longer than was expected. 30% of people had ocular effects, 20% had skin effects. Um, and the previous guidelines on the expected effects and duration of symptoms was simply inadequate and, and wrong. Now, how did uh, irritant sprays, and I'm using the UK as an example, come to be used? Well, I mean, in, in 1991, the Department of Health, having had seen some effects of CS sprays, asked um, three main government committees, including a committee on toxicity and what was called the um, Defence Committee, were looking at medical implications of less lethal weapons, um, asked them to review the use of CS. And the report from that, that, that joint committee said there was data available on the toxicity of CS and to a lesser extent MIBK in which it's carried, but very limited data on the formulated project, pro, pro, product. So the committee noted then that in 1999, that on a worldwide basis, there was no comprehensive investigations into the use of CS spray with follow-up in humans and that they needed to be done. Well, 22 years later now, I can still say that um, although apart from a couple of studies like ours, 
there is some limited medical data available on the effects of CS spray with respect to PARVA, which is approved by our Home Office for use by police officers, there, there are no um, appropriate data. Um, if you want to look at how the medical uh, fraternity look at um, dealing with uh, irritant sprays, then the Faculty of Forensic Medicine, the Royal College of Physicians, puts out guidelines to assist healthcare professionals, and in fact, the, the police and law enforcement agencies on how best to look after those exposed to irritant sprays. So again, this is a useful um, resource if any of you uh, want to look at it. The police do, however, document the use of force. All our police officers who use force of any kind are required to document, document it. And they're asked to describe the injuries to the subject, selecting the description that they believe most accurately describes the injuries. Um, they're asked to exclude injuries that had previously been used before their use of force. The point here is that what the use of force form does is allow police officers who have no medical training to record what the injuries are. And I have long said that uh, I think it's completely uh, wrong and bizarre that we rely on the data collected by non-healthcare professionals to determine what the actual um, effects in terms of morbidity are of less lethal weapons. Now, more recently, the National Police Chief Council, which overarches all our police um, services, has in consensus and in collaboration with the Faculty of Forensic and Legal Medicine and the UK Association of Forensic Nurses and Par Paramedics has developed, and this has been published in the last month or so, a conducted energy device hub. And from that, um, which gives information about what will happen or what can happen if you are tasered. But then the NPCC, the National Police Chiefs Council, is now requiring all police services to ensure that if somebody is subject to a taser discharge, they must be examined by a healthcare professional, number one. Number two, that healthcare professional must have been trained in the assessment of people who've been subject to CED means that they will know about and they will understand what the potential risks and what a full examination should be. Whereas most people, most healthcare professionals, do not necessarily know what the risks and the morbidity and the, pot the potential injury and patterns from taser or indeed other less lethal weapons are. And this is um, a taken from that form, which is accessible to, to all of you, but this is a post-conducted energy device form which summarizes all that information, which I think is a, 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 great, a great improvement. Now, how does the UK oversee that less lethal weapons? Well, there is a scientific advisory committee on the medical implications of less lethal weapons, which I'm chair. What the SACMIL does is it provides independent advice to the UK government departments and organizations on the biomechanical pathological and clinical aspects of less lethal weapon systems. And that includes training, it includes the, the particular um, aspects of, of how uh, officers and, and others may use the devices. So we're an independent advisory, non-departmental public body because we're part of government to some extent, although separate from it, we're sponsored by the Ministry of Defence for historical reasons. But we produce independent statements on the medical implications of the use of specific less lethal weapon systems. An example can be found um, at the bottom there. You can access that and that's published and it's open. And we give advice on the risk of injury for the specific less lethal weapon systems and advise when the Home Office is thinking of introducing a less lethal, less lethal weapon system or modifying one, we will be asked to review that and determine whether or not um, it should be used. And so we, we for example, look at um, attenuating energy projectiles, we look at taser, we look at water cannon, for example. Uh, paradoxically, and this is a matter of challenge at the moment, we are not required to look at irritant sprays, although there is no doubt that under UN guidelines, 
irritant sprays count as less lethal weapons. And that is an interesting development that at the moment we and government are debating whether we should have advice for that as well. Uh, we only provide advice to UK government departments and organisations. We're not a resource for um, external suppliers of, of, of equipment to come and ask whether we, we might um, be supportive of a particular device. We're tasked by government or government departments. So what are the overall concerns drawing this all sort of together? My main concerns about less lethal weapons on a global basis, every country, is there are limited data on the medical and healthcare effects of less lethal weapons. Worldwide, I think there is no question, there is a substantially increased usage of a range of these um, less lethal weapons. In many cases, there is no requirement to always see a healthcare professional after somebody's been um, subject to one of these less lethal weapon systems. And of course, because of the nature when they're used, subjects or patients who have been exposed are less likely to go, for example, to hospitals or to seek help because they are concerned that they may be implicated in whatever the public disorder was where they got, got injured. So um, th there will be a natural selection of people who may have got significant injuries not presenting with them. So what are my conclusions? Well, my conclusions are that fatalities and life-changing injury are recognized with less lethal weapons, all of them. Their use has expanded substantially in, in recent years. There's no appropriate consistent medical monitoring of effects. How their control varies between less lethal weapons and different countries that are using them. The data that is available, and by that I mean peer-reviewed medical data, do not, does not allow a proper comparative risk assessment of the use of the different types of less lethal weapons. Political expediency, in my view, encourages the introduction of less lethal weapons, chemicals and devices to manage civil unrest or acute behavioural disturbance without appropriate testing, checks or balances. And if we take the medical example, for example, within the medical setting, any of these devices were introduced into the medical setting, um, then they would not be approved with the amount of information that we have at present on most of them. So I feel that governments and those using less lethal weapons against individuals or groups should make the assessments and recording and documentation of adverse effects a routine process. So my proposals generally for any country would be all less lethal weapons and use should be subject to regular review of their usage. All new less lethal weapons that they plan to introduce should be reviewed by an independent review panel that have the power to make recommendations on their future uh, implementation. All users must be trained as per UN guidelines. All those subject to discharge or exposure require a health assessment, even though I accept some of them may not wish for that. Um, healthcare assessment should be undertaken by somebody trained in the understanding the use of that particular less lethal weapon. All injuries and effects should be documented. These should be recorded in a centralized database. The database should be held by health departments rather than Ministry of Justice or Defense or Security. There should be an annual review and publication open to all of the data and that governments should fund research into the short, medium and long-term implications of all less lethal weapons. Thank you very much and thank you for listening. I'm happy to accept questions and I'm equally happy for anybody to email me at some stage in the future.